So thank you all for joining us here tonight. And I would like to introduce sisters Marilyn Milne and Linda Kirk, who were children of the Cheese War. In elementary school, they saw how it absorbed their parents, Barbara and George Milne. As adults, they realized they actually knew very little about it and set out to learn the real story. The authors have conducted years of research through the archives and newspapers of Tillamook County and conducted numerous interviews and oral histories of key players in the Cheese War and their families. As Americans become ever more interested in food supply chains and ethical consumption, we're going to hear tonight the story of a very of very human factors behind one of Oregon's most famous brands. So please welcome Marilyn and Linda. And I'm gonna hide my video and share my screen. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Liz. We're looking forward to those questions and hope we have some answers. Um, we wanted to mention that books are available, um, especially through the OSU Press, but also in bookstores and books are available at libraries. Marilyn. Well, I join Linda in saying thank you for being here tonight. Um, I hope you all have slices of cheese uh, to nibble on while you are watching this presentation. I want to introduce, introduce our special guest tonight. This is Tilly the Cow, and she is a souvenir from Tillamook County Creamery Association's Cheese Factory north of Tillamook. So you too can have a Tilly in your life. And she's thrilled you're all here. I want to begin by introducing you to our dad. This is George Milne in the milking parlor probably taken in the evening because you have to get up pretty early to uh, do the morning milking. I doubt any of us were around with the camera at that moment. Our dad wanted to be a dairy farmer and, and after World War II, he had a few small farms in the Portland area and then was able to buy a farm in Tillamook. Now it was a farm no other local farmer wanted, which tells you the quality of the soil and uh, it was all clay. He built up that farm and he and our mother, Barbara, um, grew the herd of Jersey cows, bought more land, and he began to win awards for his dairying ability. And he also became one of the leaders of the Tillamook dairy industry. Um, he became president of the largest cooperative in Tillamook County. That was the Tillamook Cheese and Dairy Association. There were eight cooperatives making cheese at the time. Now, of course, there's just the big cheese factory north of town. But at the time, there were these small cooperatives, except cheese and dairy had about 300 some members. So it was the biggest of them. It produced cheese like the other co-ops. It also produced grade A drinking milk. And uh, at the time, the only milk that had to be pasteurized was milk for drinking consumption. Uh, cow, the thinking was that after all cheese milk is heated, so that'll kill any of the bugs and, and it wasn't required. Of course it is required now. So our dad became a grade A uh, dairyman. And as head of the association, he took on a leadership role. Now, he, I, I want to also introduce you to Bill Dixon. That He's on the next slide. Bill Dixon was head of the entire organization. So all of the eight cooperatives were uh, under the umbrella of this marketing co-op that was called Tillamook County Creamery Association. And Bill Dixon was a general manager of that uh, county creamery. So there, his responsibilities were huge. He had to market and sell the cheese and the milk. He was also in charge of all the bookkeeping for all the cooperatives. He was a uh, general manager of every single one of them. It, it, it was a heavy load. And because of all of his 
work, um, the Tillamook cheese was gaining some fame. It already had, you know, a, a reputation of being good cheese, but he really worked to um, increase that uh, reputation. And at the same time, he was very busy and uh, didn't seem to be able to sell the cheese. The storage uh, rooms at the big factory north of town were full of cheese. And so he began to want to, um, to make some, move that cheese. And his solution was to make loans to grocery stores that had purchased Tillamook's milk, the cheese and dairy milk, um, and they were bottling it and putting their own labels on it. So it was folks like Mayflower, Carnation, and Alpenrose in the Portland market. And he would make loans to the grocery stores so that they would place that milk in the stores. Um, and get a good position, good placement in the dairy case. It wasn't an unusual activity. Um, and in fact, it was approved by the Cheese and Dairy Board of Directors. Yes, you know, we, we think this will be fine, but they put restrictions on it. Um, for example, every loan had to go through the bank and be approved. And as far as we know, Beal Dixon made one loan that way and then decided that was too much of a bother and got in his way. And so he continued making loans in tens of thousands of dollars without the board knowledge and certainly without the bank's stamp of approval. Um, eventually, the Cheese and Dairy Board of Directors learned about these bad loans because they were losing money. Groceries defaulted. There was no contract for them to sign. Um, there was no collateral in most cases, but in one case, there was a collateral of a commercial mop bucket. So cheese and dairy was gonna, it was losing money with these loans. And people sometimes remember that as being the cause of the cheese war, but there were other causes. And I'm going to read from the preface of the book. The causes of what Linda and I call the cheese war can be traced many decades later. They include insults, lies, personality clashes, lawsuits won and lost, non-payment for milk, human weakness, stubbornness, fear of change or acceptance of it, and financial skullduggery. It was a fight sparked by the discovery of wrongdoing, and it resulted in relatives who didn't speak to each other for the rest of their lives as well as improvements to the statewide and local dairy industries. When we interviewed people, we were surprised that sometimes they would ask us what that war was all about. And after all the research and writing the book, Linda and I have concluded that it was a difference of philosophy. At heart, Bill Dixon believed in a strong manager form of governance. You know, I'm in charge and you put me in charge and I'm going to run this show. And yes, I will tell you about what's going on and and I will um, maybe ask your advice and opinion, but I'm in charge. Uh, my dad and the cheese and dairy board believed in the strong board model of governance. We own the co-op. You work for us. We want to hear everything and be involved in all the decisions. And so it really, those two don't blend real well. And at heart, we think that's what the fight was all about. And over to you. Okay. And this is a photo of our dad again in the evening, like the milking photo. This is after he came into the house, found his supper. We sat at the kitchen table. He went over to the desk and began talking on the phone. We took this picture because it, it just seemed to capture our dad's life and our life during those cheese and dairy years, those cheese war years. Most of the time in the evening, he was talking to other farmers. Often it was other board members. 
uh, sometimes other people who had questions or answers or issues and catch up on the news, plan strategy. So we remember him fondly sitting at the table talking at other farmers, but also a little sad that he just didn't have time to eat dinner with us. He, he had to be on the phone, he felt. One of the issues that he was working hard at in this time period was statewide dairy improvement. At that time, early 60s, across the state of Oregon, dairy farmers were feeling the threat of going broke. Distributors could set the price and they pretty naturally would set a price that was advantageous for them and good for consumers, but the farmers were in danger of losing their farms. So one idea came out of Eugene, which was to start a quota system that would result in a price set by the State Department of Ag that would weigh the cost of production, a fair profit for the distributors, an acceptable price for the consumers. And based on all of that data, would around the state of Oregon set prices that farmers would receive for their quota milk. Farmers could produce way more milk than their quota milk there was a formula for how much quota milk, but if they bought it another 10 cows and produced more milk, they could sell it, but it wouldn't be at the quota price. So it was an effort to control price and control the supply of milk. In the end, um, the legislation was approved and the governor signed it. And there was a celebration in the Milne house that somebody from Brickyard Road and Little Old Tillamook could have worked with other farmers to pass this legislation. When he was working, um, like most farmers, he enlisted his family to help him with chores. One of the things that he asked my older sister, Kathy, and me to help with was pulling tansies. At the time, there were fields that were just yellow with big, tall tansies, the yellow being the flowers. So he organized my sister and me to go out and pull tansies. And this is from the book, a penny a plant. That's what dad offered my older sister, Kathy and me to pull the tansy ragworts that had invaded our pastures. Alkaloids and tansies, a species native to Europe and Asia Minor were killing Tillamook County dairy cows by destroying their liver cells. New plants could generate from root fragments or from seeds. Before the introduction of flea beetles, ragwort seed flies, and cinnabar moths, yellow blooming tansies seemed invincible in coastal Oregon. Dad's penny a plant offer went something like this. I want you to start fields closest to the road. Pull every tansy, tall or short. Be sure to pull out the roots. If the tansy has a root, I will pay you a penny, no root, no penny. Stuff the plants in a gunny sack and haul the sack loads to the driveway near the milking parlor. Pile the plants on the gravel where I can take a look at them. We trudged out to the field, toting our gunny sacks. Some weeds were two feet tall, some almost three feet. Often it took a pull from the left and a pull from the right, and then a repeat pull from the left. At the end of the first day, we tallied our stack of tansies, 500 plants, all with roots. We had earned $2.50 each. Not bad, but not highly profitable. The next day, we headed out again. We had learned that some tansy plants grew with a single stem, but some, had multiple stocks that shared one root system. We decided to separate these stocks while being careful to keep root hairs attached to each of them. Hadn't dad said he would pay a penny a plant as long as it had a root? At the end of the day, we hauled our last loads to the driveway. We counted 2,200 stocks, all with roots at a penny per stock. The total was $22. We were rich. Dad, 
looked at our pile of tansies. He saw root hairs extending from every stalk. He examined our tally sheet. Slowly, he pulled his wallet from his back pocket. He counted out $11 for Kathy and $11 for me. Then he gave each of us a look, a long look. From now on, he said, I will pay you by the hour. I so, to this day, wish I had gotten in on that scheme. <laughs> Been momentarily rich. <laughs> the cheese war um, involved a, a lot of uh, kind of splits in families. And the kind of a symbol of that split was the what occurred under the roof of the big cheese factory north of town. This is a picture of when it was built and opened in 1949, photo from the Oregonian. And the, the idea was that several existing small co-ops would merge and go into this large factory and they agreed. And so the predecessor of Cheese and Dairy and then Cheese and Dairy itself made cheese and processed milk here behind those big glass windows you see on the left side of the photo. The building also housed county creameries administrative offices, as well as a testing laboratory, the butter making room, the cheese storage area, a dock out back for semis to back up to and haul away the cheese, tankers to take the milk to Portland. So, it was a shared facility and that worked until the cheese war. And it actually uh, went before a judge who played Solomon <laughs> and uh, decided which areas were going to be used by cheese and dairy and which areas were going to be used by county creamery. And so cheese making continued in the building during the cheese war and the county creamery's administrative offices continued to be there. And they actually had to share use of some areas. It was very um, convoluted. But what it meant was that um, County Creamery, which stored all of each co-op's records in the administrative area, um, was where two members of a co-op had to go because they sided with cheese and dairy. And then they got to thinking that, gosh, we should get our records out of County Creamery's office and take care of them ourselves since we're no longer friends. So they went in to get their records. And these two men, um, well, I'll just read from the book here. Dixon had hired a guard for the County Creamery office. George Milne recalled that, quote, he stood in the county creamery office with a revolver in a holster. The two men from Red Clover push, pushed past the guard and went behind the counter, but Dixon denied them access to their factory's files. Milne was fed up. He consulted Cheese and Dairy's lawyer who confirmed the cooperative's rights to their records. He talked to fellow Cheese and Dairy director, Vern Lucas, a former Marine, who was also angry about the situation. He agreed to go down to the county creamery office with Milne. When they entered the office, quote, this guard wasn't going to let us in past the outer office, Milne said. We just kind of moved him out of the way. I gave the guard a push and he wouldn't stay out. He came back. So I gave him a good push. I got him clear out of the way. His gun fell out and his glasses fell off and his hat came off. I remember Vern was so mad, he kicked the hat clear across the room. After that, they settled down and we went in and got our records. I had a whole list of what we had to have. It took us two or three hours. They didn't do anything. I'm sure they called their lawyer who told them they had to let us have our records. At the big factory, we had cheese guides. The <laughs> I'm having some problems moving the slide. Don't mean okay. to stop it and restart it, but yes, I know that picture. Okay. When I get it. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Liz, should I go ahead or wait? Um, you can go ahead. You can go ahead. We'll see. Okay. 
Um, there we are. There's a picture of, ah, there we are. I'm, I'm not actually in the picture, but these are cheese guides. During the 50s and 60s in Tillamook at the cheese factory, people went on tours. So a group of 30, 40 tourists would enter the make room, the cheese factory floor, and walk with the cheese guide right close to the vats and go, kind of wind through. There was often the floors were wet and the cheese guide would have a bullhorn and would explain what was going on and continue with the tour guide throughout the factory. People loved the tours and it was fun to give the tours. This photo was taken probably in the late 1950s when I got my turn to be a tour guide. I wore basically the same white dress that they're wearing, but I don't think I had a brown apron. I, I wish I'd had that brown apron. Um, this was 1968 when I helped with giving tours. And I want to read just a section from my first week as a tour guide. At home, I studied a brochure that describes Tillamook's cheese making process. I wrote facts on a note card that fit in the pocket of my... I can pick up on that. It looks like Linda's screen is frozen. Um, so, oh, there you are, Linda. Should I start over? Am I good? Um, start with the, the notes in your pocket. And... Okay. I wrote facts on a... Well, her, her uh, video is freezing, so I'll pick up on this. Um, okay, I wrote facts on a note card that fit in the pocket of my white uniform. I felt nervous about leading tours, but ready too. Before the end of the week, Anita Beeler, the, who was in charge of all the guides, let me take a group of tourists through the plant. I waited by a vat where paddles stirred heated milk. I took a deep breath and spoke loudly into the bullhorn. Bacteria culture, coloring, and rennet are added to the milk. Color is extracted from annatto seeds. Rennet causes the milk to coagulate. If anyone asked about rennet, I was ready to say that the factory used rennet made from the stomachs of veal calves. If no one asked, I would not elaborate on rennet. As the cheese war progressed, um, tensions really grew. At one point, church congregations were asked to pray for a resolution. Um, an example of the tension is that unfortunately there were death threats uh, against cheese and dairy um, leaders. Some of those leaders included Hans Luthold, we mentioned Vern Lucas, our dad, Ferd Becker, and many others. In fact, Ferd Becker was the person who received a, a letter threatening his life. This is how it was reported in the local newspaper, the Headlight Herald. Ferdinand Becker, who operates a dairy farm locally, this week offered a reward of $500 who supply, to anyone who supplies information, which results in the arrest and conviction of the person who mailed a threatening letter to him. The letter to Becker, who is a member of the Tillamook Cheese and Dairy Association, which is now involved in a controversy with the Tillamook County Creamery Association, read as follows. I have become convinced that you are out to break the association. You are to quit and desist from meddling in all affairs pertaining to the Tillamook County Creamery Association and also the TCDA. If you don't, I shall burn your farm buildings. And if that don't stop you, I shall get my scope sighted deer rifle and pick you off. I can usually hit a deer at 400 yards on the first shot. The future of our county depends on this. If you don't think I mean business, just try me. After you comes Lucas, Luthold, and Milne in that order. And no one was ever arrested um, for sending that letter. On the next slide, you'll see a picture of uh, a woman we consider a hero of the cheese war. Her name is Anita Nielsen and um, there were many heroic people during that time. 
making sacrifices, um, not milking in exactly the way they wanted to, to maximize their earnings, loaning money to the cause. But Anita Nielsen is special to us for a couple of reasons. She was a dairy farmer. Uh, she and her husband had a grade A farm and shipped their milk to cheese and dairy. At the same time, she was a Cracker Jack secretary and she got a job working for Beale Dixon at County Creamery. And in that role, she read documents, took notes at meetings, heard conversations, and she knew that the Cheese and Dairy Board of Directors was not getting the full story. And she decided to do something. She sneaked documents out of work one day, took them home, and went over to her neighbor, a farmer who was on Cheese and Dairy's board, and showed them to him. And that is how Cheese and Dairy Board learned about these bad loans that Bill Dixon had started making. She took, of course, took them back the next day. Well, the cheese war went on and finally ended and she still worked for Bill Dixon, which tells me that no one uh, told who had made them aware. They kept her secret. So as she was working at County Creamery, she was told one day to get rid of all those old books of minutes. And uh, there were ledgers, bound ledgers of minutes. I'm going to hold one up. They're heavy, uh, they're huge, and they have lots and lots of minutes in them. I, you probably can't see, it's kind of blurry. But this, these were the minutes of cheese and dairy and its predecessors. And, she was told, put them in the dumpster. Instead, she put them in her car and took them home where she kept them for many, many, many years. And as uh, she was preparing as an older woman to move off the farm, she gathered up those ledgers and went down to the farmer next door. By that time, his son was running the farm. And they were mighty surprised to have her hold out all these ledgers and say, here, keep these. Uh, but they did, they put them in the attic and they kept them for 30 years. And finally, in a fit of cleaning, they said, we gotta get rid of these. Well, the ledgers made it as far as a garage for another two years. When we called and said, we'd like to come and interview you for our book. And so we went to Tillamook and before the appointed time, Linda called on her phone from a sidewalk in Tillamook to make sure that, you know, the interview was still going to work for them. And I heard her end of the conversation. And yes, you know, they, they were ready for us. And then I heard her say, now what? You what? Oh, my, yes, we want them. Oh, thank you. And so when she hung up, I said, what was that all about? And she told me, here were all these minutes, original source material. It, we never envisioned that still existed. And so if you'd been driving through downtown Tillamook at that moment, we probably would have caught your eye because we were two grown women jumping up and down on the sidewalk. <laughs> we had really been given a gift and she really helped make this book possible. So kudos to Anita. The cheese war came to an end. This headline has Creamery's Reach Agreement, which is, is true. TCCA, that's County Creamery Surviving Association. It doesn't quite capture in the headline that our side, cheese and dairy, had run out of money, run out of stamina, run out of ideas, and folded into its rival, County Creamery. County Creamery took over the assets, took over the whole plant, took over the debts that Cheese and Dairy had, um, assumed control. I'll uh, fill in for Linda. So 
County Creamery was a surviving um, organization. And even though we knew things were bad, it was still kind of a shock. Linda, are you back? I think I am. Can okay, you good. Me? Oh, good. Go ahead. No, you're yeah, doing it, fine. It, it was a shock to us when the war actually ended. You want to read that, Linda? Okay. I hope my connection is solid here. For Milne, after the cheese war, it was easiest to revert to the self-contained farmer he had been before circumstances had demanded more of him. <clears throat> Certainly, neither George nor Barbara Milne wanted to think about the loss, and Barbara Milne didn't want to risk having her husband taken away from her again. She said, we were so naive, and her husband responded, oh gosh, yes. Barbara Milne said, we were right. We did the best we could. It was over. It was like having a tiger by the tail. You're afraid you'll get bitten, but when we let go, it didn't bite us at all. Some agree with one of the Tillamook men we interviewed who said, we got out snookered by crooked men. Since 1968, when the cheese war ended, uh, there have been a lot of changes in the dairy industry and in Tillamook County Creamery Association and Tillamook Cheese. For example, in 1963, there were 600 farmers in Tillamook. Many of them had, you know, 10, 15, 20 cows, but 600 farmers. And today there are less than 80. Those 75 to 80 farmers in Tillamook who own County Creamery um, have huge herds. In our day on the farm, you know, 100, 150 cows was a big herd. Today, 500 is barely adequate to break even. So a lot of change there. Another change is that County Creamery is now a $1 billion cooperative. Never envisioned that. Um, it is a producer cooperative instead of a marketing cooperative. And so it is directly owned by its farmers. It has 900 plus employees. Its headquarters is now in Portland, not Tillamook. It owns the Bandon brand that you see in the stores. It's a lower price point than the Tillamook two pound loaf of medium cheddar. Um, when it bought Bandon, it really upset the residents there because it, uh, the lawyers for Till Tillamook County Creamery sent letters to all the businesses that had Bandon in their name, you know, the place name. Um, and so Bandon Hardware received a letter saying, you must stop using Bandon, we own the trademark. And that kicked up a lot of dust. Um, even the city council was saying, you know, if we have to trademark our town's name, we will. That faded away, but Bandon Cheese continues as a Tillamook brand. And last year, about this time, Tillamook bought a closed cheese factory in Wisconsin. It's north of Milwaukee, and they have not announced any plans for it, but they spent four and a half million, so there have to be some plans. I would guess that it's either going to be opened as another source of cheese, you know, they're gonna use it as a cheese factory, because they have created a lot of demand and the market is opening in the Midwest and East Coast more and more for Tillamook. Or they're going to use it as a distribution center because it is close to Milwaukee and, and Milwaukee's a hub for transportation. So stay tuned on that one. Um, a recent study determined that one in five American households have Tillamook products in them. So it's quite a success story, um, but it definitely has some um, issues to be dealing with. I'll get into those in a moment, but Liz, if you'll move to the next screen. I also wanted to talk about Central and Eastern Oregon dairies and dairy products because um, Oregon has been and continues to be a dairy state. You have, for example, 
Um, well, first I wanna start by saying that traditionally the women on the farms made the cheese and they made butter and they made cottage cheese. They did everything they could to um, preserve, uh, transform the quantity of milk into some products that would last longer than, than a jug of milk. When cheesemaking became a business, most of the cheesemakers were men. And in the early 1900s, there were cheese factories at the Dells and Stanfield and probably in more places. And if you know some, please drop it into the chat. I, we would appreciate having that info. Um, this, some of our material here comes from Tammy Parr's book. She wrote Pacific Northwest Cheese. It's also published by OSU Press like Cheese War is. So we plan to get together and eat cheese and talk. <laughs> um, Central Oregon itself has had a surprising number of goat and sheep cheese makers. But unfortunately, over the last 10 years or so, you've lost a, a lot of them. You used to have Tumalo, uh, which had goat cheese, and they were bought and moved to the Fresno, California area. New Moon Goat Dairy in Chiloquin was in business. Ancient Heritage Dairy in Madras, which used sheep milk, um, and Juniper Grove Farm Goat Herd, Goat Farm in Redmond. Those all existed and, and do not today. But you still have Cotadilla, which uses cow milk in Prineville to make artisan cheeses. And then you also have dairies that sell milk and other products, but not cheeses. The, the big one that you probably all know is Everhard's in Redmond. It supplies goodies uh, with milk and it actually makes the ice cream for rock hard at Juniper Junction. There's also Windy Acres Dairy in Prineville that sells privately to locovores. And then uh, we've been told that the Yakima Valley is another source of milk for manufacturing dairy products. And wow, do you get to enjoy ice cream. <laughs> All the ice cream that's made in the area, for example, Snowcap in Sisters and Bone Todd Gelato in Bend, and then they're in many uh, grocery stores too. And it's actually run and owned by a former Tillamook family. Um, I mentioned Juniper Junction at Terrebonne, Goodies in Bend and Sun River. And then you have Addie Mac Catering, which has made a chevre ice cream. So soft cheese, using soft cheese. And also a honey mascarpone with hazelnut brittle and bee pollen. Expanding beyond Central Oregon into Eastern Oregon, there's Yuma Pine creamery and those folks at Milton Freewater used to live in Tillamook too. Yuma Pines milk is used to produce, to be uh, turned into cheese for Walla Walla Cheese Company. And I, we understand that Walla Walla has just started making ice cream. So another great source of ice cream. The big cheese, pun intended, in Eastern Oregon is at Boardman. And that is where Tillamook Cheese has moved the bulk of its cheesemaking operation. Um, in fact, they also brought in some mega dairies, you know, 40,000 cow dairies to the Boardman area because they wanted that milk to be ready, readily available for their cheesemaking plant in Boardman. And so, Morrow County, where Boardman is located, is the answer to the question about which Oregon County has the most cows. It has almost twice as many cows as Tillamook does, and uh, far, far more than Deschutes County, for example. Because most of its cheesemaking operation is now not located in Tillamook, County Creamery was um, hit with a lawsuit that claimed deceptive marketing practices in its advertising 
all the advertising shows beautiful coastal Oregon scenes, lush green grass, contented cows, ocean. And so it has been sued for deceptive marketing. Um, the, just the other day, a judge ruled that the plaintiffs would have to prove that because of the deceptive marketing, consumers paid were willing to pay more and did pay more for Tillamook products, even though most of it didn't come from Tillamook. So we'll see how that lawsuit progresses. But at Boardman, it is industrial level cheese making. And someone could argue that's workable. Um, others would not. For me, one of the factors is that the terroir, the taste that's created by a specific climate and soil, uh, that terroir is so different from Tillamax. And so the taste isn't the same. Um, I do buy one kind of Tillamook cheese because I know it's made in Tillamook. It is called Maker's Reserve. You have to practically take out a loan to be able to buy it. It's quite high end and it's aimed at the gourmet market. Um, but the taste of the raw aged cheddar reminds me of the taste of the cheese in my childhood. So I recommend that to you if you happen to <laughs> have some spare money. And now with the purchase of a Wisconsin cheese factory, will Tillamook cheese lose its terroir altogether? And referring back to the lawsuit about deceptive marketing, if they do make cheese in Wisconsin, how are they now advertising? So this, these are questions that interest me. And I wanna get to your questions too. Um, first, I want to tell you that we continue to put information and uh, photos from the cheese war on our on our uh, our web page, which is cheesewar.info. So, Liz, if you'd move to that slide, if it will allow you, um, cheesewar.info, and then we also have a Facebook page called Tillamook Cheese History. So you can go to those at any time. And if you have questions, we're, we're happy to tackle an answer to them. You might wanna know about what it was like growing up during the cheese war. You might wanna know about our research or how we work together, um, but we're, we're standing by ready for questions. Um, thank you, <clears throat> Linda and Marilyn. Sorry about the technology. I don't, I'm not quite sure what was happening, but. Um, we did have some questions come in, so I want to get to those. Um, Heidi Rowe would like to know if you had Tilly as a child. <laughs> no, <laughs> I did not. She, Tell us I about Tilly. A, I found her in a secondhand store, <laughs> but uh, I do understand she's uh, modern versions of her are available at the cheese factory, but mine is stamped with a little Tilly from Tillamook. So she's, she's got a brand on her rump. <laughs> nice. Um, and Heidi also wants to know, and I, and I actually wrote this down as well. We're, we have some questions about the tansy pulling scheme. Um, <laughs> Go says, just, just want to say that the plant pulling scheme was very clever. <laughs> and I want to know how long it took you to pull all those tansies. Well, I have to give my sister Kathy credit for the idea, but I saw the merit <laughs> and I certainly helped with the whole enterprise. You know, I wish I could remember just how long it took, but I would estimate that we went out right after lunch. Dad would often get the cows in and start cleaning up to milk around 4.30. So probably something like one o'clock to four or five, we were tired. And the tansies are heavy and put them in a, in a gunny sack and try to drag them, you run into cow pies. So you wanna put them on your shoulder, you're dealing with all your clothes covered. It was heavy, hard work. And that smell of the tansies all over our hands. We thought it was a great idea, but dad never fell for that one again. <laughs> he made sure to pay us by the hour. And I will yeah. add that to this day, when I smell a tansy, it just takes me right back because when I was big enough, tall enough, I too pulled tansies. 
And so just last week, we were out at a park and there was a tansy and I marched over and I yanked it out of the ground. Um, unfortunately, tansies I seem to be making a comeback and um, that's, that's hard on animals uh, who would eat them and then have their livers harmed. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Heidi, full of questions tonight. She would also like to know, this is a little bit of a history question. Um, is the cheese making, is cheese making tied to specific ethnicities? So I'm just wondering if you know about the history of cheese and when maybe and where maybe we saw cheese first starting to be produced. So yeah, yeah. I'll start. Um, there is something called the Northwestern Milk Belt, and that stretches from Northern Europe across Northern America. And it's called that because we are the folks who continue to drink milk after, um, you know, after the baby is weaned, we still drink, consume milk. And so while cheeses are available in the Middle East, you know, there, there are cows definitely around the world, but the majority of um, cheesemakers in Tillamook came from Switzerland or Germany. So it was a um, Caucasian enterprise in our experience, but I do know that cheese is made in other parts of the world. Yeah, thank you. Okay, last question from Heidi. Um, she sees, uh, you see the growth in artisan beer. Will this trend come in vogue for cheese? I hope so. I mean, I, I think I'm seeing I it hope now. so too. <laughs> right? <laughs> the more the merrier. I, I was telling Liz, I don't have a meat drawer in my refrigerator. I just fill it full of cheeses. Um, and they don't have to be high-end expensive cheeses, you know, play, uh, companies like Kerrygold or um, Murray's, they, they make quite fine cheeses. But um, Tillamook faced a fork in the road in the early 90s. They could see that their marketing was working and they could see that it was going to outstrip the supply. And so they wanted to get into places like Safeway. And to do that, you have to be available uh, for all the Safeways. So they decided to go big. And I tend to wish they had stayed more in the gourmet artisan, um, you know, more yummy to me cheese, but they, they made that decision to grow. And now they're kind of uh, trying to address that artisan aspect with the Maker's Reserve brand of their cheese. Thank you. I, I cannot wait to ask this question. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> question uh -oh. comes from Terry, who is a cheesemonger at Market of Choice in Bend. And Terry, I will say, I have stopped by the cheese counter multiple times. You have a delicious selection of cheese there at Market of Choice. Um, she says, your talk is most interesting. I recently met the founder of the now out of business Tumalo Creamery. What pressures and hurdles, hurdles do cheesemakers face that make them go out of business? Uh, today's cheese maker has to either decide to be small and um, uh, priced. A priced, specific niche, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. to, to be an artisan, to, uh, for example, have 25 cows and use those cows' milk to create marvelous cheese. And so you do have that in Central Oregon. Um, and uh, it's pretty great that Market of Choice does have such an amazing selection. I, I bet some others do too, but I love that, that we have a cheesemonger in the audience. 
Um, Tillamook County itself has an artisan cheesemaker called N Nestucca Bay Creamery. They have their farm out of Cloverdale, which if you've been up 101, you might remember. And then they make the cheeses and have a little storefront in Cloverdale. And they make, you know, everything I mentioned, brick cheese, I think. Well, they make brick cheese. They make all kinds of cheeses. And they also are online so you can order it from them. And every kind I have tried has been delicious. And so I think, I think um, cheese makers have to make that first decision. They either go big like Tillamook did, or they stay small and exclusive and marvelous. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to add, I was talking today with uh, one of the people who is now, they have Milton Free Water. Help me out, Marilyn. What's Yuma the name? Pine. Walla, Walla, Walla Walla oh, Cheese Company. Yuma they, Pine, both, yes. both Yuma Pine and Walla Walla Cheese Company are making cheese in Milton Free Water. And she said, this is in contrast to going out of business. She said that both couples have done so well with their cheese mm -hmm. that they, it didn't make sense to continue to share. It made sense to each go independent and their sales are doing well. Their products are good. The market is responding and they're feeling really optimistic about the future. Eat cheese, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so last question is from Marilyn, although I, I do have maybe one more question. Um, Marilyn, the name of the, wants to know to be reminded of the name of the cheese, um, which, mm. which was the original flavor from your childhood, and Tillamook butter. And what was the second part? Uh, that, that Marilyn loves um, the Tillamook butter. Oh. So, but what was the name of the cheese? Yeah. Tillamook uh, makes a product called Maker's Reserve. And it used to actually have the cheesemaker's signature on the package, which is how I was sure it was made in Tillamook. And it's made in small batches and it is wonderful. Um, and as for butter, yeah, Tillamook butter is good, um, but as time goes on and they expand and there's more demand, um, you know, they're not going to be able to make all their butter in Tillamook. And so like they do with some of their ice cream, they farm it out and, and um, have other companies make it. So uh, if you're buying Tillamook butter and thinking it's made from Tillamook milk, it may not be. Yeah. So but just, I, I'm just super about how much of the original... Um, large factory is still in operation or in use, or is it not anymore? Linda, you want to start with the well, remodel? Yeah, um, I would say, wild guess, it's all still in use, and they've expanded and enlarged. They've had several major remodeling efforts. Um, the latest one was maybe a couple of years ago. They had their grand opening. No longer do they give tours. Um, Instead, they have areas where you can view and videos you can watch. They sell lots of ice cream cones and they, they have it set up now to be really entertaining and welcoming and they get lots of tourists. It's a good place to stop as you're driving along and, and you can eat lots of free samples of cheese and uh, you can, they also have a restaurant too. So it's a good place to stop. Yeah, I went. I was in cheese nirvana. Loved every minute of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, any last questions uh, from the audience who are who are here with us tonight? This has been really delightful. I can't think of a better way to spend uh, a Thursday <laughs> evening than talking about um, and Tillamook and cows and hearing about the real uh, behind the scenes drama that that. Uh, came about because of all the dairy farms. So we well, really learned a lot tonight. Um, go ahead. I just wanted to say we're just so happy that you invited us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.
Yeah. So everybody who's on the call tonight, you're all going to get a, an email with an evaluation. We sure would appreciate uh, if you took a minute to fill that out, just so we can hear about your experience tonight. And Marilyn and Linda, super delightful. Sorry about the technical difficulties, um, but thank you for being patient. And we worked through it and really enjoyed, enjoyed your presentation tonight. Thank you. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.